So in this brief, I'm going to focus on three backfill techniques, GSLs or sand grid, crush stone, and rapid setting flow of fill, also called flash and splash. Uh, but I wanted to mention we have tried to backfill and cap craters with damn near everything by this point. So if you have any questions about things we've tested over the years, uh, feel free to reach out. You know, obviously varying levels of quality of material is going to get you more passes. You know, Lance mentioned about how heavy the Air Force kit is uh, in terms of having to bring the equipment with us. That was all driven by the requirements. So trying to get that many craters done in that amount of time, you just need big equipment and high quality materials to meet those requirements. So we didn't create it big just for the heck of it. You know, it was, it was designed to meet a specific requirement. But in uh, this brief, we'll start out by talking through uh, GSLs. Next slide. GSL, also known as sand grid, cellular confinement system used to reinforce soils. Uh, basically, it allows you to take a lower quality backfill and make it a little bit better as a backfill material. And the confinement improves the bearing capacity of the granular soil. It's kind of the um, experiment like you've been at the beach. You know, you pick up sand and it just kind of flows out of your hand. But you can put an umbrella in, in the sand and the further down you go, the more stable it is because it's got confinement of the sand around it. So that's kind of what we're trying to do in each of these little cells. We're trying to provide more and more confinement over uh, the, the area of the backfill to increase the bearing capacity of that backfill instead of just putting it in there loose and trying to get back to it. So that's what gives uh, sand grid its improved uh, strength. Next slide. All right, just some general characteristics. Uh, like I said, uh, it sounds like a lot of y'all have seen this pretty good bit just in case, you know, collapsed and then you expand it out. When you got it collapsed, it's about 12 feet by six inches and then it, you can actually expand it out to 19 to 23 feet by eight to nine feet. Next slide. And then the full section of GSLs, it's about 10 by 29. And then the individual cell, once it's expanded, should be about 10 by nine inches, something like that. Next slide. So kind of the repair concept that we're going to talk about this week is using the GSLs. Uh, you got your two layers, and then we're typically talking about putting FRP on top of it, uh, mainly because, like we talked about, in order to uh, land fighters and so forth, you want to have a, the, the cap on it to prevent any fog from damaging the aircraft. And those two little black lines you see, we typically recommend putting a geotextile where those little black lines are located, and we'll talk through that as we go through the repair method. Next slide. Uh, just on that previous slide, I had to excavate 16 to 17 inches. Uh, I think, you know, one of the briefs earlier had 16, webs at 18. You want to do a little bit more than 16 because they're eight inches high, so you don't want to be, it, it's an easy method, but you got to kind of add a little precision too, right? You, don't, you definitely don't want the, the cells sticking up above the surrounding pavement, that's bad. But then if you get them below the pavement, then you've got unconfined material. You know, even if you only end up with like an inch, as soon as that fighter comes over, it's going to smash down that inch and all of a sudden you've got a rut to deal with. So you want to get it as close as possible to flush with the surrounding pavement. You want it to end up that way. So if you target around that 17 inch area, by the time you get it built, you should be pretty close. So there's a lot of steps here, but a lot of them are really easy steps. So don't uh, and it's one you probably do without even thinking about it, so we just wanted to go ahead and do it in the, in the classroom. Next slide. So the first thing is uh, once you've got your mark crater, you've got to cut the geocells and your geotextile fabric. This is just an example. A lot of times we use 8.5 feet by 8.5 feet. Obviously, you know, you would tailor that to whatever size repair you have. Uh, for 8.5 by 8.5, it ends up being about 10 by 12 cells uh, with that configuration. Next slide. So typically what we do is cut it away from the repair, so somewhere where you can stake it down um, and place the rebar in the corners to make sure you stretch it fully and count the number of cells and then cut it with a uh, razor knife. Next slide. So once, you know, at this point we've already got the, uh, the crater, you know, excavated. I talk about it a little bit in my compaction brief, but before you do this, it is always recommended to compact the subgrade uh, before you start putting in your backfill. That'll typically make your repair last a little bit longer. 
And obviously with excavating, you're gonna loosen that soil. So before this step, you would actually pack the subgrade and then put your geotextile fabric at the bottom. Next slide. So the first layer of GSLs, this is important. You wanna make sure the configuration is correct to uh, maximize the life of your repair. You wanna um, expand parallel to the center line of the runway. So as you're laying them out, traffic's this way, that's the way to remember it. You just wanna expand in that same direction, parallel to the center line. Uh, once you got it in the hole, you wanna place a stake in each corner, expand it, and then, um, Place uh, your stakes in the four corners to make sure it's fully expanded uh, within the repair. Next slide. Uh, backfill with sand. You want to fill the edges first to kind of hold it in place. That uh, is going to help the, keep it from collapsing as you're trying to, to put the sand in. Next slide. You want to try to drop it vertically because if you kind of move it horizontally, you might collapse the cells again. You know, you got to be a little careful. You know, don't be too careful. It slows you down too much, but you definitely don't want to get your cells out of position. And then once you got it close up near the top, you want to overfill by about two inches. And as you're doing that, use your hand tools to spread the sand evenly. Don't forget to take the stakes out. Next slide. So after that, uh, compact, uh, we recommend two coverages with the plate compactor. I won't go into that too much because I've got a whole other brief about how to do compaction and backfill. So but that's the, the next step. All right, next slide. So after that, you want to remove excess material because again, you know, we've got that target uh, we're shooting for with the surrounding pavement. So you want to scrape off. This is what it should look like. You should barely see the tops of the cells in the, the first layer. Next slide. Then we're gonna place that next layer of fabric, so make sure you cut two pieces when you start, that way you've got the other uh, fabric ready. The fabric is just to keep out, if you have any fines, you don't want those interfering with your uh, sand layer, that would kind of contaminate the material, so that's what, what that's for. Next slide. So next, we wanna make sure we put this layer in perpendicular to the first layer we did. So in this one, you wanna expand perpendicular to the center. And again, we're basically just going to repeat the process that we just did. Next slide. You know, what we just talked about, backfill with sand on the edges, drop the material vertically, overfill by a couple inches, uh, compact, and then remove that excess material from the top, and hopefully you're right at that level, you know, with the, uh, even with the surrounding paper. Next slide. So any questions on GS, GSL slash sand grid? I think there's some experience in the audience with this material, so uh, good. So the other one we wanted to talk about was just if you're using a crushed stone backfill. Uh, crushed stone is a good backfill. It's pretty much the highest quality you can put in other than something that's actually cementitious. Uh, the more well graded the material is, so if it's got different sizes, you know, some fines and some bigger pieces, it's going to compact together better and be higher quality. Um, and it's uh, probably going to make the repair last longer. The procedure, uh, just place the material into your prepared crater, level the material with uh, rakes or shovels and compact it. Uh, I'm going to go into this more during my compaction like I talked about, but you don't want to uh, compact greater than a six inch lift to make sure you get the proper density. And I'm also going to talk about this later too, but if the material is really dry, you can add a little bit of water to get it closer to optimal moisture content to enable it to compact better. Next slide. So I only had the one slide on crushed stone. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? <laughs> okay. So uh, Lance mentioned this a little bit. This is rapid setting flowable fill backfill. This was developed as part of the crater JCTD with the Air Force uh, back there in the mid 2000s. So we've been working on this material a uh, long time. It's a pre-packaged, pre-blending, pre-blended material that hardens uh, really quickly. It's self-compacting, which really just means you don't have to compact it. And that's the major advantage of the material. That's why we went with it for the radar process, is because compaction takes time. This is a really quick method. It's strong, it's forgiving. If you put a little bit, not enough water, or a little too much, it's still gonna set up and perform adequately. Um, like I said, main advantage, rapid stream, no compaction required. Um, the setting properties, I mean, you can, put construction traffic on it in about 30 minutes. And uh, we usually, it only cures about three hours by the time we place our rapid setting concrete on top. 
which carries for two hours. I mean, we're putting loads on this at only three hours of carrying time. Uh, next slide. So this is, I call it the dry method. Uh, my, my boss calls it the slash and splash method. So I, I tend to, to not, not use that one as much just to spite him, but uh, what, a, what a bad name for a precision process of, of dropping some material into a hole. But uh, basically, I remember the first time I read this, I was like, this works, really? Uh, basically, you extend the super sack over your you know, prepared crater that you've already excavated and that's ready for backfill. And you cut the bag open and try to move your forklift around and move that dry material around um, as much as you can. And then you just sprinkle the water and the, the water just causes the, uh, flows through the material and percolates and causes the material to start to hydrate and gain strength. And each one of those super sacks is about one cubic yard, typically initial set, so the water will have percolated typically in about 20 to 30 minutes. Next slide. So just a detailed procedure. I like to wet the bottom and the sides of the excavation so they don't try to steal water from your material. Dispense it uh, into the repair. The Air Force does a little bit different, trains a little different. They actually use a pressurized hose to move the material around as it's coming out of the bag. Uh, typically how we've done it is just put it in the hole and then move it dry. Because when it's dry, it's not as heavy and it's a little easier to move. Uh, then we typically put about 40 gallons in once we put one bag in the repair. Allow, you know, after you put that water in, you can go ahead and add the next super sack of material. On the very last one, I usually use about 25 gallons because, you know, you can have a little bit of standing water on the lower bags because you're putting another bag on top that's going to absorb all that. But when you get to the top, you don't want a bunch of standing water. So um, I typically go with 25 gallons, which has worked uh, pretty good in the past. And you want to basically, as you're doing 25 gallons, you don't want to you want to make sure all the material is hydrated. You don't want any dry spots, but you don't want to flood it either. Uh, like I said, you don't want to end up with uh, standing water before you put your capping material on. Next slide. So again, you repeat this procedure until you get to the target backfill level. Um, move material again as you're going, you know, as needed and it's ready to be capped and you don't see any free water and it's all percolating through the material. Typical tools and equipment you would need is a forklift, some way to boom it out over the repair, uh, water source, hose and flow meter. Uh, concrete rakes, typically what we like to use are, are garden bow rakes would work too. And then a knife to cut the material open. Next slide. So safety on this, uh, kind of similar to what we've been talking about, but if you see that, that last bullet on there, Whenever you're working with cementitious materials, you want to have an N95 mask. That's a, a requirement, I believe, across the military. Uh, you definitely want it because uh, breathing in cement is not good for you. So just make sure you've got that if you're working with this material. Any questions on rapid setting for fulfill? Yes, sir. Has there been any talk on the design for the actual super sack? We have a lot of issues with them breaking. With them breaking as you're picking them up? Yeah, so Lance and I were talking about that at lunch, actually. We've, uh, sounds like the manufacturer's got a kind of a different method we're gonna try that's kind of a Ziploc bag is how you describe it, right, Lance? Um, so we're gonna try to get some and see if we can improve that. Um, one big thing, you know, well, these are supposed to be stored and I was gonna say UV could uh, impact the straps. One big thing, you don't wanna move it across the forks that much, you wanna try to, boom out where the straps are right next to the vertical part of the forks. You know what I mean? So when you pick it up, if you got any little burr or anything on the forks, it's gonna scratch it and possibly drop it. That's one safety thing too. You definitely don't want to be underneath the bag at any time, right? Um, only thing is you can watch it one fall to, to realize that. Um, but as we look at the, you know, the full linings there, as, as Lance mentioned, we're trying to assess the shelf life of these materials. We don't want to buy them all the time, but we don't want them to set up either. So we've tried to line them with something to prevent moisture. Um, but we might need to look at the strength of the bag material too. Yeah, long-term study on that. Yes, sir? I'm glad you mentioned on that moisture because I'm facing that and that's the uh, biggest problem. It's a kind of drop to come in. It comes from different elements of the atmosphere. So once they arrive, we start, 
So you've seen big boulders in the, the super stacks?